We're in Tarragona. Today is the 8th of June 2005. We're with Professor Josie Lambert from the University of Leuven in Belgium. Welcome to Tarragona, Josie. First, what's your current job? What, what are you in real life? I thank you. First of all, I'm glad to be at Tarragona. So, sorry about that. No, 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 no. Very, very good. I'm glad to be at Tarragona. Tarragona is like a home place for so many reasons, even if the people are always different. But uh, what am I doing in my current life? I am one year ahead of my retirement, Belgian system which means that everybody now knows my age. I am still teaching, but for the last year I tried to reduce a little bit my teaching in the traditional sense in order to have more possibilities for teaching in the more futuristic environments. First of all, devoting more time to PhD supervision and devoting more time to e-learning interaction with colleagues in research, mainly on translation. I used to teach mainly in literary studies. Little by little, I moved more and more into research on translation and that kind of stuff. Yeah, you're still in a department of general literature, comparative literature. Uh, your terminology is good, but no one uh, can get rid of the Belgian traditions. It's a department that used to combine all kinds of national literatures and that uh, put in the middle, in a central function, uh, general literary theory together with comparative literature. Uh, to add uh, one strange thing, not all national literatures represented at my faculty are part of the department. My uh, cohabitation with the Department of Literary Studies while dealing with translation is not simple for several reasons, uh, but it is, uh, I would say, we can survive in it. Let's, let's, let's get back to that. Okay. Uh, yeah. You started as a literary scholar. That's you, very you, correct. When you were in your 20s, I suppose, you were doing a doctoral thesis on English Kleist, I believe. No, uh, no well, uh, Kleist was there all the time. No, on the way the French treated German Romanticism okay. during, say, one century and a half, since 1800. Okay, okay. So comparative literature, you... Know, Abs okay. Absolutely. And uh, how did you get from there to translation studies? There you ask a question that I have just treated today in one of my classes at Barcelona. I discovered that if you want to deal with intercultural relationships, literary relationships, there was one black spot, fully black, the entire question of translation as a component of intercultural literary relationships. And I got in trouble seeing that there was no real answer. And that was my fascination. And after all, it explains how translation got into the picture in my university and not only in my personal life. Did, did you find that black spot by yourself or were you in touch with translation scholars at that stage? To be frank, I started my MA thesis and since I got a good degree in the first year, I was allowed to start in the second year, which was an anticipated MA thesis. I was a Flemish student in the in a program on Romance Philology at Leuven and my supervisor was francophone but was a very open mind and he was interested in comparative literature. And among the topics I suggested to him at that moment, there was, for instance, the French translations of Kafka. 
I'm, I still feel sorry that I didn't really get into it, but I still remember a lot from that very moment. So without even knowing what comparative literature was, I was already looking for translation as part of the literary program. It's only afterwards that I discovered that uh, scholars in the field of literary studies, scholars in the field of comparative literature, had not really taken that into consideration. At that, stage, that was in 62. Right. Yeah. Okay. 60s, 60, 60. There, there was no 61. translation studies as such. Nothing. No. Nothing, nothing at all. I could still quote literally the reply, not only by my professor, positive reply, and uh, rather panic reply by his assistant, who happened to be uh, the daughter of Maurice Grevisis, mm -hmm. the man from the French grammars. Yes. Historical moments. How did you get in touch with people who were recognized now as translation scholars? I don't know, Andre Lefebvre, Gideon Turi, but also Levi Popovich, uh, yeah. and the people working in Belgium as well. Or James Holmes. I mean, yeah. how did that form? So, quite a story. It's a long way to Tipperary. I make it short. Yeah, yeah. We don't yeah. The first happy, beautiful opportunity I had for jumping into real research on translation was due to Raymond van den Broek, who was finalizing his PhD thesis under the supervision of a professor in Dutch literature and literary theory. So that was rather exceptional. They didn't know well where to put him. Now Van den Broek brought to Leuven and to me, and we discussed. He didn't really take me seriously, say at that moment, and whatever. Uh, but he put me in touch with Holmes, who happened to come to Leuven, and Holmes brought quite a few other people. I've and that's James Holmes, who was working in Amsterdam. Exactly. And then, little by little, the train started working. So the main event, due to that concatenation of hazards, was the 1976 symposium, where Holmes was the real impresario. He brought even Zohar there. He brought even Zohar brought Turi, and so on. I've never met Levy. I've mm -hmm. met Popovich afterwards, but I was aware of his position in the world of translation studies because Van den Broek was a very good friend of Popovich's. Okay. So I, I could really still write the history of all these events. It was very interesting. So sometimes you're associated with something called the manipulation school, around the, the book edited by uh, Theo Hemmings. Is, was there such a school? Yeah, this rings a bell. First of all, the concept of manipulation in that kind of groups, there was not one group, there were several subgroups. The concept of manipulation has been used for the first time around 1985 and afterwards, not before. And uh, that's the publication of the book? Yes. In which means that the concept that uh, has established the book and the idea of a manipulation school is an anachronistic view mm -hmm. on the development of that book. But it was a joke. Okay. So the guy who used manipulation first was Theo Hermans, mm -hmm. and he told me how they selected it in interaction with the publishing house. To, to indicate also an additional uh, component in this conceptual development. Theo Hermans, I met him for the first time in 76 during the Leuven Symposium. He was all the time side by side there with Lievendurst. And there was a third man, uh, a third person, I wouldn't mention any name in order to avoid mistakes 
neither Durst nor Theo Hammonds really opened their mouth during that entire symposium. But I would say that this exactly may have implied that their, their career has changed. So they were among the best members of this audience. It also indicates that Theo Hermans, after all, started up his career and all the rest, under, certainly under a strong impact of that meeting, but that he was already, like Levendorst, part of new subgroups and subgenerations. So manipulation is not born in 76, is not born uh, with Turi nor even Zohar, is born at a moment when a young guy felt the need of disseminating things that he had experienced in these different subgroups. Okay. So that's Theo Hermans. That's yeah. Theo Hermans, and uh, we, we didn't worry. We, we laughed. What about what you know, sometimes called a descriptivist? Peter Newmark calls him a descriptivist as a pejorative term. Do you, do you accept that? Well, first of all, I accept anything, uh, everything that Peter Newmark says because it's his statement. Mm. So uh, I would wonder how he would know uh, that I am a descriptivist or that I am not. But one of the first discussions I had with him was once during a colloquium, after colloquium, a nice moment with Peter Newmark. We were shaking hands, and he said, yeah, well, Target, it's a beautiful journal. And I said, okay, thank you. Uh, you because you're one of the co-editors of Target. Yes. Uh, yeah. 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 And uh, he said, it's a beautiful journal. And then the second part of his sentence was, but you are a descriptivist. <laughs> and my reply was, so what? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Would, you, would you place yourself within descriptive translation studies, which is getting into term? Would you see that as a, as a name for a school of thought? Yeah, I would try to answer in a very Turi style uh, based uh, manner by saying that it depends on the kind of definitions you use and the kind of norms underlying your definitions. Okay, that's too complicated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but move on, no, let's move on. descriptive is anyway. I'm, I'm not. I, I'm. I'm not worried. But uh, if there would be a, a strict definition of a descriptivism, I would say no. Okay. So and it's this tendency to reduce people to schools, yeah. even in that sure. group between 1970, 76. 80, going from Vandenbroek, Turi, Popovic, to Hermans and so on. There were no, 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 no schools. Mm -hmm. So you try to put people into their lock. Okay. Your contribution to translation studies has been considerable. Um, through countless edited volumes, uh, through Target, uh, with Gideon Turi, and especially through Cetra. Uh, could you explain in about two seconds what Cetra is? Yeah. Yes, I can because I have just been teaching somewhat in this area today at Barcelona. Cetra, just like Target, is one of the f formats that the institutionalization of the so-called descriptive research on translation has taken, whether we put it in a narrow definition or not. It's not the only one and so on. But it's in very basic terms uh, the kind of a dream worked out because it means that not only you can be into research and do research and organizing research, but that you can train researchers. Research training in the humanities and even beyond the humanities at this moment in Western universities is something exceptional. So CETRA is still a dream, and I'm glad this dream has been shared by quite a few people. Okay. 
So the search has been going now for, what, 10 years, 12? It's since 89, the same year as, as Target. Target. Okay. Yeah. So it's the 17th session coming. So over the years, that makes a lot of researchers that have been trained. Yes. Yeah. So Something like 300 or 350 on five continents. Okay. Also, more in recent years, you, you've, you've done a lot to broaden the scope of translation studies, which is surprising for somebody with a literary background. You're the one who talks most about translation operating in all the media and in everyday life. Do you think that's the future for translation studies or that's a direction that we should be heading in? I'm grateful for the question, which implies already that I would tend to answer by yes. Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, translation studies in my university is still located within a department of literary studies, which is, after all, a very strange position. But does that department need research on translation? Yes and no. Translation is both more specific and larger. So the question of translation and research is not a question for a department in linguistics and literary studies or whatever, only it should be a question for all these departments. But I am convinced that the question of translation is very basically linked with the idea of societies, their organization, their communication, their organization of language, and so on. You seem to be heading towards a more sociological perspective. Sociolinguistic, sociological. Is that a fair characterization? Yes. And I'm not really an expert in this approach like you are yourself, or uh, Daniel Simeoni, and even uh, our younger people like Rene Melas and so on. But I think that they have always seen translation from such a point of view without, uh, say, trying to ignore the more specific constraints of translation, uh, la language, and so on. So you but wouldn't argue against the linguistic, narrowly linguistic approaches to translation? Um, I'll answer with a pirouette. My last article was, in, uh, was entitled, with question mark, is translation studies to literary. It has just been published, it's out, it's available. It's going back to a round table chaired by Yves Gambier at Copenhagen at the EST conference. Uh, I promised him for quite some time to finish the article. It's finally finished and my answer to the question is yes, translation studies is too literary. Then I try to explain how it comes. I say the last people who are responsible for that, who are members of literary departments, uh, like myself, not even Turin or even Zohar, the last people who are responsible for that are very often people who have a linguistic background and who try to deal with translational phenomena on the basis of individual cases and who project on that ideas they have about language discourse and they go for interesting media texts and so on and they behave like literary scholars from the 60s and the 70s. Okay. Uh, those people who discovered translation from within literary studies did this, did so with a strong dissatisfaction uh, with the state of art or the state of affairs in literary studies mm -hmm. and were uh, a little bit nostalgic for a certain kind of basic explanation of phenomena. Okay. And so maybe going too far into the sociological area mm -hmm. and not enough into the, in the interaction between individual and collective and institutional phenomena. But you would be making that critique that linguistics, when it comes to translation, doesn't use it to question linguistics. Exactly. Okay. But Whereas lit literary studies has. Uh, no, a few, a few people in. Uh, well, linguistics, linguistics has this, yes. Mm -hmm. 
but they don't link the kind of uh, questions for general regu for regularities. They don't link it, for instance, with the differentiation that we probably have discovered on the basis of systemic and sociological thinking. So they don't embed linguistic phenomena in social factors, not well enough. Okay. In Ghent, in, uh, at the beginning of 2006, there's a symposium at Ghent that tries to promote a linguistic turn in translation studies. I refer to that in my article on is translation studies too literary? Because it's interesting to see that suddenly that linguistics realizes that indeed they have hardly done anything serious in terms of translation research for quite some time. Okay. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for the job. Yeah. <laughs>